for those of you who are not already an old hand at Zoom and have not attended one of our webinars before, you will notice that your microphones are set to mute and your video cameras are off. That's just a pre-setting, so please don't be alarmed. It just stops any background noise um, from interfering with the broadcast. We are looking forward to your questions and comments. If you have questions for the panel, please use the Q&A function to type any questions or comments on your screen and that will make sure that we see them and I'll share the questions with the panel for them to answer during the webinar. If you have comments you want to share with everyone on the webinar, um, please use the chat function which um, will we'll share comments more widely. We are going to be recording this webinar and a copy of both the webinar and the slide presentation will be available on the Doughty Street web website soon after we finish for you or any colleagues who are unable to attend. The format for the webinar will be as follows. Um, we'll be um, um, presenting for an hour, finishing at four o'clock. Alistair McKenzie will start by dealing with the history and case law prior to Jeanne Gulligason in order to understand the background of the case. Saul Stone will then discuss the judgment and its findings in relation to the fee waiver policy. Alistair will then speak about the issue discussed in the judgment about making a human rights claim, the Assan argument. And then we'll return to Saul for advice on how to make fee waiver applications now. We anticipate that the presentations will be about half an hour um, in total, leaving plenty of time for questions and comments at the end. So please do send these through um, both during the presentations um, and at the end. So to start off, um, I will hand over to... Right, okay, thanks very much Zoe. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, I hope you're all keeping well. So we're going to be talking about the decision of the Upper Tribunal in a case called Zinico Ligason. Um, Zoe, could we just move over the slide, please? Um, it isn't uh, in the, on the UT website yet, or at least it wasn't when I checked a few minutes ago. Uh, obviously, we hope, indeed, we expect that it's going to be a reported decision. But for the moment, this is where you can find it. There's a link on an article on the Doughty Street website on the page you can see in front of you. Um, so essentially, just to give you a very broad outline, because as Zoe has said, Saul's going to deal with the, the detail of the judgment. The tribunal finds the Home Office's fee waiver policy to be unlawful, uh, essentially because it applies the wrong test and it effectively excludes people from getting a fee waiver who ought to be entitled to one. Um, so first of all, it decides that the fee waiver policy is wrong to apply a test of destitution. Secondly, it includes some important concessions by the Home Office. Uh, about the nature of a human rights claim and how you make a human rights claim. And there are some helpful findings along the way on quite a number of other matters in the course of a very uh, thorough and, dare I say it, impressive judgment by Judge Blundell of the Upper Tribunal. As I say, Saul's going to go through what the case decides, but before we get to that, I want to go through a couple of the old cases. And I think it's important to understand uh, what was being decided in Zeneco Ligason and what the areas of dispute were. And in order to you know, understand what the battleground was, so to speak, it's important just to go back a step or two and see what the previous cases said. Could we get the next slide, please? So before about uh, 2013, there was no provision for getting a fee waiver uh, for an in-country claim on the basis of private or family life. Obviously, Article 3 claims and asylum claims have always been uh, fee exempt, but that didn't apply. Uh, to Article 8 cases. Um, and the case which decides that sh there should be provision for a fee waiver um, in certain circumstances is this one uh, that you've got there called Osman Omar, or Omar, um, a decision of Mr. Justice Beetson. And the facts of Omar are just worth dwelling on for a moment or two because they were quite odd and they help to explain why the Home Office took a bit of a wrong turn, uh, willfully or otherwise, in its understanding of what human rights law required in terms of fee waivers. And these uh, unusual facts kind of resonate down the years, as we shall see, and they help to explain why the argument was as it was several years later. So Mr. Omar had faced 
deportation following a conviction for a serious offence, but he'd uh, successfully resisted that through a combination of his poor health. He'd been taken very seriously ill when he was in prison, uh, and the fact that he had children here, so back in the day when you used to be able to win deportation cases on the basis that you had kids here. Um, but because he'd uh, committed an offence, he got only six months leave to remain. And to make matters worse, he'd originally arrived in the UK on a false ID. And when the Home Office came to grant him leave to remain, guess what? With that super efficiency, which we all know and love, she granted him leave to remain in the wrong identity, i.e. in the false identity that he'd used. So that took several months to sort out. So by the time he came to apply for further leave, he'd only just got his status papers in the right identity. Uh, and throughout that period, he'd been on Section 4 support, asylum support because it was accepted that he was otherwise destitute. So there's the destitution test appearing straight away on the facts of his case. And he sought a fee waiver when applying for an extension of leave to remain, because he said he couldn't afford the fee for his further leave to remain. And the Home Office said uh, no. Uh, and on a claim for judicial review, the Administrative Court said that that was unlawful. And broadly speaking, the reasoning in Omar is that but given, given his successful appeal, he couldn't be removed. If he couldn't be removed, he was entitled to be granted leave to remain. The Secretary of State couldn't leave him without uh, some form of leave to remain. Uh, she couldn't put him on temporary admission or give him no status at all. That's obviously a principle uh, established in cases such as S, the, the Afghan hijack case. Um, and then if the need to pay a fee operated so as to prevent him getting leave to remain, on human rights grounds or even from applying for leave to remain on human rights grounds because he couldn't afford the fee then that was unlawful okay so it was unlawful to put a bar in the way of getting leave to remain or even applying for leave to remain to which he was obviously entitled um, and the important point is that mr omar frames his case as i can't afford the fee his argument is not i'm destitute because i'm on section 4 support it's i can't afford it it's much broader um, however, the Secretary of State interprets that decision, uh, as you won't be particularly surprised to learn, in the narrowest possible way. And she interprets it as being restricted to situations where the facts are basically analogous, namely that the person is destitute. In other words, meets the test which would apply for Section 95 or Section 4 support. Uh, and that's the basis of the first version of the fee waiver policy, uh, which is brought into um, force in 2013 uh, and it says essentially that you have to prove that you're destitute in order to get a fee waiver. Could we move to the next slide please? So the second case that then comes up is a case called Carter and again the facts are just worth dwelling on for a second or two. He's a young man from Jamaica, he's seeking leave to remain on the basis of his private life, he's been here since a very young age and he's living with his grandmother. Uh, and she pays him a small amount out of her pension to meet his day-to-day uh, -day living costs. So he's not destitute, uh, that test coming up again, he's not destitute because he's living with his granny and he's being fed with her, fed by her, um, nor is he at risk of becoming destitute because, you know, his granny is not about to kick him out on the street. But obviously Mr Carter and his grandmother don't have hundreds of pounds, as it then, then was, to spare to pay the Home Office fee. So Mr Carter illustrates very clearly the difference between someone who's destitute, as defined in Section 95, for Section 95 and Section 4 purposes, and someone who's unable to pay. So he, he's the paradigm, in fact, you could say, of someone who isn't actually destitute, but nevertheless in practical terms can't apply for leave to remain unless he gets a fee waiver because he doesn't have any money. Okay? So the question in Carter becomes, what's decided in Omar, what does Omar decide? Was it limited, as the Secretary of State said, to situations where the person is destitute, as statutorily defined, or at risk of being destitute, or was it broader? And Mr. Justice Stewart says uh, no to the Secretary of State's arguments. He says uh, Omar is not limited to cases which are the same on the facts, it's of wider applicability, and the question is, can the applicant afford the fee? or as he puts it, can the applicant get their hands on the hundreds of pounds necessary to pay the fee? So that claim's allowed as well. And interestingly, um, the Secretary of State was granted permission to appeal in both those cases, but then she didn't pursue it, um, probably realizing that she didn't have a leg to stand on. 
Um, but despite losing in Carter and being found to have misunderstood Omar and found to have misunderstood what access to human rights required, the Secretary of State didn't change her policy. And the current policy, which dates from January 2019, continues to focus on destitution as the correct test. So that's the basis on which the Zeneko Ligerson family come to apply for a fee waiver. And Saul's going to explain to you what happened and what the case decides about that. And then I'll come back and talk to you about what it says about human rights claims. So over to Saul. Hi everyone. So um, as Alison said, I'm just going to give a brief background to the case um, and how it illustrates um, this gap which we identified in terms of destitution versus affordability. Um, and then I'm just going to talk about the judgment and basically why the policy was found to be unlawful and why the decision was unlawful in this case. Um, so it was a family of five Ghanaian nationals. Um, the two parents entered the UK about 15 years ago. Um, they had three children and all of them were born in the UK. Um, so they were overstayers, so they didn't have leave to remain at the time, um, but they applied um, for leave to remain on Article 8 grounds through their representatives who were Ramphel um, at the time. At the time of making the application, um, the combined fees were going to be 7,665. Um, so that's the immigration fees and the health surcharge. Uh, therefore, Ramfell um, assisted them in applying for a fee waiver um, to waive the fees. So the representatives at the time um, placed in a detailed application, um, they explained that the family weren't destitute because they were housed um, by the charity of friends. Um, they were also receiving some subsistence from their friends in terms of um, basic living needs, food and um, clothes for the children. Um, but they didn't have um, enough money in their account to pay the fees essentially. Um, as part of the application, they submitted um, bank statements, um, which showed that they had a penny in their savings account. Um, there was also letters that were submitted from friends um, outlining the support that was received. And the overarching point that was made in the cover letter was that they, they couldn't afford the fee. Um, and they simply couldn't raise the funds necessary in order to um, pay for the fees. That application was um, obviously refused. In the decision letter, the Home Office focused directly on destitution. So the majority of the decision letter referred to the fact that the family weren't destitute because they had access to adequate accommodation um, and they wouldn't be rendered destitute by payment of the fee. Um, the decision letter continued to talk about exceptional circumstances and stated that none applied in this case um, and therefore um, the applicant hadn't proven that, that they couldn't pay the fee. One of the things that the Home Office sort of jumped on in this case was that some of the bank statements that were submitted didn't have, um, they weren't fully annotated to basically say where the money was coming from and what it was for. Um, but as was submitted in the later pre-action correspondence, um, even if all of that money was put together, it was around 3,500, um, that money wouldn't have been enough to have paid the immigration fees. Uh, we can go to the next uh, slide now, Zoe. Um, so, pre-action letter was sent and the Home Office maintained their decision um, and that obviously led to um, this, this case. Um, so the two main grounds that we put forward um, was that the fee waiver guidance is unlawful um, because it fails to implement the previous case law which Alistair was just discussing. Um, we also said that the decision was unlawful on the facts because the respondent failed to take a holistic approach to the evidence and didn't fully assess the evidence in front of her because if she did, and she couldn't have rationally thought that the family could have paid the fees. Um, in the judgment, um, the judge first set out that, and it was agreed between the parties as well, that the tribunal has the authority um, to interpret policies um, in accordance with um, the objective meaning that a reasonable and literate person would describe to them. Um, so that was accepted at the outset. Um, and then Blundell, went on to discuss why he thought the policy itself was unlawful. Um, he started by saying that there was fundamental difficulties with the fee waiver guidance um, and, and then continued to sort of list what these are and I'll, I'll just go through them fairly quickly. Um, the first thing that Blundell says is that it's not expressly stated in the policy that the underlying test is actually affordability and not destitution. Um, this is something that Blundell comes back to time and time again actually in the judgment. Um, and he attached a lot of importance to the fact that 
the actual test of affordability is not mentioned um, in the guidance explicitly. Um, he also um, talked about the structure of the guidance as well, um, and in particular pages 13 and 14 of the guidance. Um, that's where the tests are set out, um, which is how you can be granted a fee waiver. So they are whether you're currently destitute, whether you will be rendered destitute by payment of the fee, um, and whether exceptional circumstances apply. Um, Wundell was stated that um, the text that appears under the exceptional circumstances subheading um, actually relates back to the destitution test, and that was something also raised by Alistair as well. Um, and that introduces a level of confusion when caseworkers are actually looking at this policy and trying to apply it to clients' cases. Um, another point that was raised as well uh, by Alistair, but was also accepted by the judge, was just the simple number of times that destitution appears in the policy. Um, so at least 40 times were noted. The judge said that that's not determinative, um, which obviously it isn't. But when looking at the situation as a whole, if there's 40 references to destitution, but no de references to affordability, um, then obviously um, that would imply that the policy um, is irrational and unlawful. Um, he then goes on to discuss um, exceptional circumstances because in this case it was accepted that the applicants were not destitute and they wouldn't be rendered destitute by payment of the fee. What the Secretary of State tried to push back on was that in, in other cases um, the exceptional circumstances test would apply which would mean that if you're not destitute and you wouldn't be rendered destitute you still wouldn't be required to pay the fee if you didn't have the money. Um, but the judge didn't agree with that interpretation of um, the exceptional circumstances test and said that the way that it was written was confusing. Um, and it, he also said an interesting point as well about the, the caseworkers that are applying this guidance because it's all well and good solicitors and lawyers um, sort of having a go at the guidance and raising um, these arguments in open court. Um, but he made it clear that the caseworkers that are reading the guidance, they're not lawyers and they can't be expected to, um, to be so. Um, so the guidance needs to be clear, it needs to be straightforward in terms of um, what it's trying to say, which is the affordability test, and on the facts, um, it wasn't, it was confusing in parts. Um, just going back to the exceptional circumstances test, um, Blundell said that um, by putting in a threshold of exceptional, exceptional circumstances, um, that further obscures the question of whether something is affordable, and it also erects a threshold um, which shouldn't be present. Um, on the page in the actual guidance, when it talks about sectional circumstances, it gives, uh, gives an example um, of a sick child who's an unusual drain on a family's resources. Um, Blundell thought that that reinforced the impression that something had to be exceptional in order to qualify for a fee waiver. Um, and it was that point that he didn't agree with, because in this case, as Blundell said, there was nothing exceptional about the client's circumstances. Um, they just couldn't afford to pay the fee, but they weren't destitute, but there was nothing exceptional about their circumstances. So taking that into account, um, Judge Bundle thought that there was a real risk that the guidance would be applied um, unlawfully, um, and that it would be confusing um, to, to case workers. Um, can we go to the uh, next slide, Zoe? Thanks. So after um, stating why he thought the judgment was unlawful, um, the Secretary of State still continued to push back um, and say that, well, actually, the decision in this case was lawful. Um, and the reason that they used was they focused on the fact that the bank states weren't annotated. And um, they said that it was up to the client to put forward that evidence. Um, on this point, um, Judge Bundle explained um, that there needs to be um, holistic approach when assessing financial evidence um, and that's important because looking at the facts of this case they had no money and um, they weren't able to work they didn't have status so they couldn't take out a bank loan or a credit facility um, and there was no one that they could borrow the fees off so even if um, some small evidence was missing if someone submitted a lot of evidence the secretary of state needs to consider that evidence and consider all of the information in the round before deciding whether or not um, someone is is able to pay the fee um, 
the way it was actually put in the uh, judgment, which was um, originally submitted by Alistair and again accepted by the judge, um, was that the respondent seemed to have seized on the absence of specific evidence and thrown up her hands rather than seeking to engage with the importance of the evidence in which she was presented. Um, on the issue of the um, annotated bank statements, um, the judge again noted that even if the uh, income into the account, which was £3,600, um, was all put towards the fees, um, that still wouldn't be enough to actually pay the, the full fees of the application. Um, and for all of these reasons, um, the judge found and that the decision was unlawful anyway, um, but in any event, um, the judge said that if the policy is unlawful, then the, the usual um, route would be that the decision made pursuant to that um, is unlawful. Um, and, and just one final point on that was to do with borrowing money, because I know that's something that affects um, a lot of people when they're applying for fee waivers. One thing that's commonly raised by the Home Office is um, you can borrow the money to pay the fee. Um, that's more relevant in a case like this, where they're already being helped out by friends and family. Um, so in that situation, the Home Office um, want evidence from those people that they can't pay the fee. Um, now, in the judgment, um, Lundell basically didn't, didn't agree with that, um, that, that it was reasonable to expect um, a multitude of people, some of who aren't even named on the application, to pay for the fee. Um, and he said it was a, an impossible hurdle um, to, um, to get over for applicants. Um, and I'll go on to that a bit later when we're talking about um, making fee waivers and um, going forward. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say on that bit. Okay, so that's me again. Could we get the next slide up, please, uh, Zoe? So one of the Home Office's counter arguments is a rather peculiar one, which we ended up calling the Arsan argument for reasons which will become apparent. Um, and as Saul has said, they accepted that the previous cases, Omar and Carter, were correctly decided. They accepted that the test was affordability and not destitution. Um, and apart from arguing somewhat implausibly, you might think, that their policy was consistent with those cases, the Home Office said that the basis on which those previous cases had been decided was wrong. Uh, and the basis on which they said that was that those previous judgments had failed to take into account that the Home Office had now conceded that a human rights claim doesn't require a fee and a form, and that people can simply write to the Home Office saying that their removal will breach human rights. And the Home Office would have to treat that as a human rights claim and would have to consider it, even though no form and no fee had been used. Now, just to clarify, in case that seems a bit strange, that is their defense, yeah? That's not our ground of challenge, that's their defense. They defend their fee waiver policy by saying, actually, you don't need a fee waiver because you don't have to pay a fee at all for a human rights claim. Article 8 claim we're talking about. Now, obviously, that's a pretty surprising defence in many ways, a defence which rather burns down the entire structure of the fee waiver policy as regards Article 8 claims. And it's also a, an astonishingly far-reaching concession. And I'll show you shortly that it mirrors a concession made in a couple of earlier cases, one of which is, is RSAD. Um, although the Home Office seems to have backtracked on it somewhat in, in some other cases, but it's very helpful to have it repeated in clear terms here. If you want to look it up, if you've got the judgment, it's in paragraph 71, where uh, essentially the Home Office is uh, at lunchtime, or after the lunch break, handed up a note, um, making all of these concessions, more or less after we'd sort of backed them into a corner, where they had to either accept that these concessions were correct or, or come up with some other explanation for their uh, behavior. So essentially the Home Office said was, what the Home Office said was, in order to fall within the terms of the definition of a human rights claim, that's in section 113 of the 2002 Act, a human rights claim does not require to be made in the form of a fee paid application under the immigration rules. I'll just repeat that. A human rights claim does not require to be made in the form of a fee, pay, fee paid application under the rules. They then said, human rights claim ought to be made by a fee paid application in the interests of orderly decision making, Priority may be given to that sort of claim, but that's not a statutory requirement. And even if a claim is made in some other form, 
an applicant won't be removed from the UK until it's been considered. They went on to say that the covering letter that the appellants had or applicants had sent in with their fee waiver application was a human rights claim because it clearly raised Article 8 points. They accepted that it was a human rights claim. They accepted that they couldn't remove the uh, applicants from the UK until that had been considered. Um, and that they were entitled not to consider it forthwith. In other words, they could defer uh, consideration. They then went on to say, and I'm quoting here, uh, it's desirable in the interests of orderly and efficient decision-making for a human rights claim to be made by way of a fee paid application for leave to remain. If the applicant makes such an application, it will be considered and determined in accordance with the rules, and priority may be given to that application. If the applicant makes no such application, she will not be removed from the UK unless the human rights claim that she made in her covering letter is considered and adversely determined. Okay, can we move on to the next slide, please? So the first point is, well, you know, who, who knew? Who knew that the Home Office had accepted that you didn't need to pay a fee for an Article 8 claim? as long as you didn't mind your claim being put to the back of the queue. Perhaps more importantly, um, where is that in the fee waiver policy? Well, you know, the answer is obviously it isn't. Where is it in any other policy? Again, as far as I'm aware, it isn't. Uh, and above all, as regards this particular case, where was it in the decision letter for these particular applicants? Well, again, it wasn't. On the contrary, very far from saying, we accept you've made a human rights claim, which we've got to um, consider, the Secretary of State told them that their application was invalid and that they were liable to be removed to Ghana. She didn't even say, you know, removed to Ghana subject to us considering your human rights. It was just, you, you're liable to be removed. Secondly, as I flagged up earlier, it's a <clears throat> somewhat weird defence to a claim that a fee waiver hadn't been granted to say, oh, but you didn't need to pay a fee to start with. It's a defence which, as I say, ends up more or less destroying the entire system of fees and fee waivers for, for Article 8 claims. And they do that in order to defend this single claim for judicial review. I mean, really, who thought this was a good idea? Uh, the applicants hadn't run their claim, on, or at least initially hadn't run their claim, I should say, on the basis that a form and a fee weren't mandatory for human rights claims at all. This was an argument, as I say, run by the Secretary of State, which was supposed to be a defence, which obviously ends up handing us an additional indeed one would have thought more or less unanswerable ground of challenge because the secretary as i say hadn't done what she said in her own defense she was supposed to do which was treat the human rights claim as valid and agree to consider it thirdly she was wrong to say um, that the previous cases hadn't been decided on that sort of basis in fact uh, an almost identical argument was run in osman omar and uh, mr justice beatson had rejected it as being confusing and contradictory. And then finally, it's obviously enormously problematic from a number of perspectives. First of all, where does it leave the best interests of children? As the judge points out towards the end of the judgment in paragraph 119, how is it consistent with the best interests of three children to leave them in the hostile environment and refuse to even consider granting them leave to remain until some unspecified time in the future? That's bad enough for adults. But for children, it's clearly uh, unacceptable. For another thing, as the judge discusses in detail, and this is where it helped perhaps having a judge who was a former hoppo, as, as many of you will be aware, Judge Blundell was a hoppo for many years before he transferred to the bar and then got promoted quite quickly into the judiciary. Um, the internal mechanisms of the Home Office just don't work like that. Where, as a matter of policy, or as a matter of individual consideration of the case, would the Home Office actually record that a human rights claim had been made and ensure that it was uh, considered before the family were thrown onto a plane? There was nothing in the decision letter which said that that was what was going to happen. On the contrary, as I say, the decision letter said that they'd be removed without any mention of further consideration. Was there any internal mechanism by which the Home Office would identify that the Secretary of State had accepted that the applicants had made a human rights claim which needed to be considered. And the judge asked that of uh, leading counsel and you won't be particularly surprised to hear that he got no answer. So in addition to the fee waiver policy itself being found to be unlawful and being quashed, there are now very wide opportunities opened up to people to make human rights claims without a form and without a fee in more or less any circumstances, it would seem. In fact, also it would seem regardless of whether they can actually pay. Uh, 
Now, the exact implications of that obviously remain to be sorted out. And it's true that in a number of the cases, could we have the next slide, please? A number of the cases, the uh, Home Office's position has been very unclear. Uh, and I'm just going to briefly go through uh, those cases just so we can get the context. And somebody I, I saw flagged up MY Pakistan. I'll come on to that in a second. Um, so the first case in which this arises is ARSAN. ARSAN is one of the language testing or ETS cases. Uh, and the Home Office there concede that any human rights claim had to be considered regardless of whether a fee had been paid and regardless of the timing or format of it. Uh, in fact, one of the applicants in ARSAN had raised her human rights in a statement provided to the Court of Appeal in support of her uh, appeal. And that was accepted to be a valid human rights claim, even though it observed you know, none of the formalities that you'd expect, no form, no fee. In fact, it wasn't even sent to the Secretary of State in the first instance, it was sent to the Court of Appeal. But that was accepted by the Home Office to be a valid human rights claim. In Balajigari, which is one of the tax inconsistency cases, it was held that a human rights claim could be made in a covering letter on the back of an application form uh, applying on a different basis. And in between those, you've got this rather odd case called Shrestha, where it's found that a human rights argument raised in a Section 120 statement didn't constitute a human rights claim. In fact, it wasn't even arguable that it did. This is a permission decision in the Court of Appeal. It wasn't even arguable that uh, a human rights claim, sorry, that human rights points raised in the Section 120 uh, statement constituted a human rights claim. Now, it's very hard to understand why not. Uh, and it's pretty hard, at least for me, to see how Shrestha sits with Arsan or how it set, sits with the concession made in, in our case to Neko Ligerson. And then there's the recent decision of Mr. Justice Lane, the president in MY Pakistan, in which he finds that the Secretary of State is entitled to adopt a practice of requiring forms and fees in human rights claims and is entitled not to consider claims which haven't been made in the correct form. Now, we put in a note after the hearing um, in Zeneca Ligerson to make the point that MY Pakistan appears to be contradictory to it. Um, now, Judge Blundell decides that that's not the case. He decides that his decision isn't inconsistent with MY Pakistan. Um, the fact is that the Ligerson concession wasn't repeated, as far as one can see, at least not in such stark terms in MY Pakistan. Arsan is barely mentioned at all other than in passing. Lane simply focuses on Shrestha, which is obviously the, the, the harsher of the, of the previous decisions. It's not entirely obvious to me that MY Pakistan can stand. It's really only if you read MY Pakistan quite liberally, quite generously, and assume that Lane wasn't intending to go behind Arsan and Balajigari that you can consider it consistent. So it, it, is, it is slightly problematic, but there, there is, a, I mean, I'll, I'll leave you to read it. It's kind of complex. So I won't go through it now. There is a passage in Ligerson where uh, Blundell goes through our submissions on MY Pakistan and he picks out a paragraph of MY Pakistan, which he says shows that it's not inconsistent. Um, but you can take your own view on that. So there's quite a lot of things still to be sorted out. Um, for example, is a human rights claim made without a form and a fee an application for leave to remain? In other words, is there some sort of distinction? Thank you. Uh, is there a distinction between a claim and an application? Uh, can the Secretary of State uh, decide to lawfully decide to deprioritize human rights claims, which are made without a form and a fee? Uh, does Section 3C apply if you've applied um, while you've already got leave? Um, I'm anticipating some questions which may, may have been raised already. Um, my answers personally would be tentatively yes to the first question. A human rights claim made without a form and a fee is an application for leave to remain because you have to be granted leave to remain if you can't be removed. And that of course was the starting point of Omar, if you remember, uh, back in 2012. So it's kind of hard to see how you can disentangle the concept of uh, arguing that your removal would breach your human rights from the concept of seeking leave to remain. It's two sides of the same coin, basically. So if you claim that your removal would breach your human rights, which is the definition of a human rights claim, uh, then you're inevitably and necessarily making an application for leave to remain. 
Secondly, can the Secretary lawfully deprioritise human rights claims? Well, probably, probably yes, as long as that's not the only consideration. And in particular, as long as children's best interests are respected. And that's a point that Blundell makes in, in quite a lot of detail, as Saul has already said. Section 3C, well, again, yes, it probably does apply, if you ask me. Uh, when you look at the purpose of Section 3C, it's intended to protect the position of people who are seeking leave to remain where the Secretary of State fails to make a timely decision before their existing leave comes to an end. So why should that exclude people who are making human rights claims? It's very far from obvious why that should be the case. Why should it make a difference whether you paid a fee if a fee isn't necessary in the first place? You know, nothing on the face of Section 3C seems to say that it does make a difference, but it remains to be seen. I've got a case in the uh, upper tribunal at the moment where we've been refused permission on the basis that there is some sort of distinction between an application and a claim. Um, and we'll see whether that stands up uh, uh, when we take it further. But that's all pretty tentative. The courts will have to sort it all out. There would need to be, I think, cautious advice uh, as to what to do next. And of course, we don't know if the Secretary of State will pursue her appeal. She got permission to appeal. We don't know if she's going to pursue it. Uh, and if so, whether they'll get anywhere. Saul's now going to deal with some of the practicalities of seeking fee waivers under the new policy. Thanks, Alistair. Um, so, yeah, as Alistair just said, um, the Secretary of State was granted permission to appeal. Um, so we're currently waiting to see whether they appeal or not. Um, if they do appeal, then nothing will change for now until the outcome um, of what happens in the Court of Appeal um, the judgment would be stayed. So going forward, um, the policy would remain the same until um, and unless the decision was maintained in the Court of Appeal, um, at which case um, it would probably have to be changed uh, quite a lot based on the judgment. Um, but in terms of what we can do in other cases, because um, I've been contacted by a few people and have seen um, quite a few um, fee waivers, obviously. And I think the Ligerson case, it can be used uh, in pre-action correspondence. In the first thing is what we've said throughout the whole webinar really is that the truth test is affordability that's accepted on both sides um, regardless to what happens um, in any appeal in Ligerson that is the test um, that's to do with the policy um, but the actual underlying test is accepted by both sides to be affordability um, so if you do have clients that's what we should be putting in because through no fault of their own that was the policy a lot of the time people argue on the basis of destitution because they try and fit themselves within the policy um, but I would argue just based on affordability um, and whether your client can afford to pay the fee, regardless to whether they're destitute or not. Um, and that was something that was highlighted in the judgment as well um, and submitted by Alistair, which is that obviously if you are destitute, you can't afford the fee. But that's just a subset of people who can't afford the fee. Um, so it's better to argue the, the wider point um, in any pre-action correspondence you have with the, with the Home Office. Um, on the holistic approach to evidence, um, I think that's important as well in Ligerson. So I touched on that before. Um, invariably, there's certain things missing. Um, one really common thing is when people don't have a lot of money or they don't use bank accounts. Sometimes they just can't get statements or accounts are closed, things like that. So you can provide two bank accounts, but you can't provide the other two. Um, then that's being refused. Um, I think Ligerson helps with that as well because it shows that the Home Office can't just say, oh, well, you've not provided this one bank statement, therefore we can't assess anything, um, when actually they look at the wider picture um, and see that actually um, you don't work, you don't really have any income, um, and on the evidence that you have provided, um, they should obviously make a positive decision. So I draw the attention to, to those aspects of the judgment as well in any pre-action correspondence. Um, the same applies to third-party payments. Um, this case wasn't directly about that. I mean, obviously it was, um, it was a relevant factor. Um, this seems to come up quite a lot as well in, in referrals that we get. And a lot of questions that we get asked are, is it reasonable to expect a third party to pay the fee? Um, and if it is, um, you know, what difference does this case, if any, make to that? So obviously it depends on the facts of the case. And this is something I was discussing with Alistair recently, actually. So, if it's a family member who you live with, it might be reasonable to expect them to pay the fee. Um, in a friend situation, um, it's probably not reasonable. And in Ligerson, it was friends, um, and the judge stated that that's not something um, that could be expected of them to either be given the money um, by this benefactors, as, as, as it was called, 
um, or, or expect them to borrow them the money when they don't have status and have no way of paying it back. Um, so if you do have fee waivers that are refused on the basis of um, lack of third party evidence, um, then I do think that's something that we should be pushing harder on, um, society and legacy, but also just citing the individual facts um, of the case. M one thing to make sure is just that you kind of put all your eggs, you're clear at the beginning in your cover letter, you know, a detailed cover letter explaining the client's circumstances. So you don't need to preempt what the Home Office is going to say. So I've had cases where um, there's been a household and the family's lived there. It's reasonable to assess the family's circumstances, um, but maybe only one person in that household works, so you just provide those statements. But if you don't make clear in the cover letter that the other people don't work, and that's why you haven't provided the statements, because they don't have any money, um, when that comes to be refused, which it most likely would be, um, it'll be more difficult for you to challenge it because you've not made that information available. But if you provide um, the best information that you can, um, then I think it's, it will make um, your, your application stronger. Um, and just on a final point, I mean, I don't know if this is um, sort of a coincidence, um, but since uh, Liga since happened, um, all the pre-action letters I've sent, which has been about four or five, um, they've all um, come back and just granted the fee waiver. They didn't even respond to the pre-action letter. When we raised all these points in detail, um, they've just granted it. So I don't know if that would work for everyone or you know if, it, if it's changing um but it's just something to consider because that's not the experience we were having before and i know that's not the experience of a lot of charities and and other ngos that are helping these clients that's it from me zoe thanks so much um quite a few questions have come through and try and get through as many as possible um, there have been a couple of questions around savings and how the arguments may apply to savings and a specific question on um, how might we advise clients who are on a low income um, may be raising universal credit to top up income and have to make a further leave to remain application in 30 months time. Um, is that a case of saving money but not at the expense of um, doing without essentials um, so thinking about um, um, issues of savings and then thinking into the future of further leave ap applications and savings I wonder maybe if Alistair might take that first and saw add in anything else yeah I think I, I just say as a sort of general um, general guidance you know professing all the all the answers to all the questions really at the moment, I think one we want to be pretty cautious about the advice one gives. One doesn't know whether the we don't know whether the Home Office is going to pursue their appeal. We don't know what their policy is going to look like exactly uh, if they don't pursue their appeal, or indeed if they appeal it and then lose it. Um, so I think the cautious advice in most cases is going to have to be, you know, if you can afford to pay the fees, pay them. If you can't seek a fee waiver on the basis of a correct understanding of the policy, i.e., on the basis that the policy should be uh, directed to um, affordability and not destitution. Um, and you should probably only apply without a form and a fee uh, if you've got no choice. Um, coming on to the question of saving money, well, I mean, I, th I think it very much depends on the facts at the risk of stating the obvious, but I think it must be the case that the courts would not accept that people had to make massive sacrifices in order to pay home office fees and i've drawn an analogy with the case of unison in the supreme court where the supreme court were very unhappy with the idea that people should be expected to sort of cut back on their reasonable day-to-day -day living costs in order to afford the fee for going to an employment tribunal and i think the same sort of test has got to apply i mean if you're living a very profligate lifestyle that's one thing but if you're you know trying to bring up your kids on a on benefits or on a low income then almost certainly not but we'll see i mean the, the these things will have to be thrashed out it's reasonable to predict that the home office will try and adopt again a very narrow reading of the policy and it may have maybe that these points will have to be uh, uh, argued over and over again but i i think for people on benefits it's it's really very difficult to see how the home office could justify expecting people to um save large sums of money even if they had a couple of years over which to do it so was there anything you wanted to add to that or uh, no that's fine that's great so um 
Um, other questions are around um, partial fee waiver applications. Um, where would you say the case leaves um, partial fee waiver applications? Um, and I don't know if Saul, you want to take that one first? Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, again, really, as Alice has said, um, it depends on um, what happens with the case in terms of whether it's appealed um, or whether um, it's not appealed, in which case the policy um, would change. So um, that would obviously have an effect on all applications. Um, in terms of um, partial fee waiver applications, um, just the, the same things that I said before, really, um, in terms of um, you could use the stronger points in the case in terms of the holistic approach to evidence and the third party payments argument about whether it's reasonable for someone to contribute. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically what I would say. Alistair, anything to add on that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's again, just going to come down to the, to the facts in each case. I assume by partial fee waiver claims, we mean situations where one member of the family is, uh, is paying and the other ones are seeking a, uh, a fee waiver, is that right? I mean, I, I think, well, first of all, as I say, the Home Office have been applying the, the wrong policy anyway, so it's, it's always going to be down to what, what they can afford. Uh, and that would presumably still be the case, you know, if it was a situation where one fee could be afforded and, and not the others. Um, it's always going to come down to a question of, of, of fact, I'm afraid. Um, following on from that, um, and a couple of questions around applications. Um, the first around... Um, um, in the light of the judgment um, where in sort of general experience the Secretary of State doesn't accept an Article 8 application without a form, um, how that leaves the situation in terms of submitting an application without a form. Um, and a separate question um, um, regarding the ASAM concession and being able to make an application without an application form and fee waiver. Um, um, where does that leave, if the Home Office grants leave, um, payment of the immigration health surcharge? Um, would you still need to obtain a fee waiver for that after there is an agreement to grant leave to remain? Um, so perhaps two separate questions there. Um, maybe Alistair, you could... Okay, so on the immigration health surcharge, I think what the Home Office conceded in terms of saying that they couldn't require a fee to be uh, charged would probably apply to the immigration health surcharge, health surcharge as well. So I think they probably can't insist on that. Um, obviously, if you get a fee waiver, you get uh, the IHS um, waived in any, in any event, as I'm sure everybody knows. Um, they certainly didn't seem to be suggesting that there would be any sort of different approach to the health surcharge uh, as opposed to the fee. Uh, and I think the, the logic of their position would have to apply to both. Um, sorry, what was the other question? The other question was just about what, when people, or whether people should apply without a, a form and a fee, was it? Sorry, you're muted, Zoe. Um, it was about um, um, being able to make an application without a form and a fee. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, as a, sorry, yeah, as, as I said, I think be cautious about that because we don't know exactly how it's going to uh, pan out but the concession it seems to me is pretty clear that you don't have to do that. What the uh, knock-on effects of doing that might be as I say remain to be seen it might be that the homeless will basically just park your application indefinitely. Now you might be quite happy with that you know you might I've spent 18 and a half years here and be coming up to 20 years and be quite happy for the Home Office not to deal with your human rights claim for, for another year and a half. But, um, you know, that will depend on, on, on the individual uh, circumstances. Um, you know, for people who've got leave to remain, will making an application without a form and a fee preserve their Section 3C leave? Well, again, we don't know. My opinion, yes, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not the court. I'm not the tribunal. Um, so we, all of these things, as I say, require us, I think, to take a cautious approach at the moment, at least. 
Saul, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, not on that. Okay. One um, further question. Um, I, I, I'll read it out. Um, will there be any recourse for applicants who've previously applied in time and been refused a fee waiver and then subsequently had a fee waiver granted out of time after 3C leave ended? Um, would they be starting again on the 10 year route to settlement? How might that be? Um, um, and then it further states, currently indefinite leave to remain can be granted on long residence grounds with discretion where there's a 28 day gap in lawful residence, but um, more than 28 days only if there are exceptional circumstances. Um, any reflections on that? Um, yes, so obviously, again, it depends on um, what actually happens with this case and whether the policy stays in place or not. Um, if it is found to be unlawful, I mean, I'm just speculating here, but if you think about other cases like Kerry and Bin Loss, which we've used in unlawful detention cases, um, unlawful um, decision impacting unlawful detention, um, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't apply here if someone applied for ILR on the basis of exceptional circumstances, um, because they ordinarily would have had ILR at that stage, if not for the unlawful decision. Um, I can see that argument um, having merit. Um, but as Alistair said, we can't um, provide specific advice on cases. Um, but that, that would be my opinion on it. And does Alistair have anything further to add? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a great question. Obviously, the um, judgment doesn't cover this, but I think you'd probably have a very good argument for saying that you shouldn't be disadvantaged you know, certainly in human rights terms, by the fact that the Home Office op operated an unlawful policy to prevent you getting leave to remain. You'd have a very strong argument, I would have thought, uh, you know, obviously depending on the individual case. But, you know, this is the kind of question, you know, other people have raised the question of whether people can now try and get refunds on uh, fees which they shouldn't have had to pay. Well, again, you know, maybe. Uh, it's, it's certainly something worth thinking about. But all of these things are, are, are matters which are going to have to be sort of shaken out in, in, uh, in policy discussions and in uh, case law over the next, uh, next few months. Um, a further question um, on um, sort of reasonableness and practicalities around um, banks and um, whether you've had experience of banks refusing to give a loan for application fees, uh, what the expectations are, um, if a bank does refuse a loan, um, would the application applicant be expected to perhaps go to high, places with higher rates of borrowing, such as loan sharks, that kind of thing? What would be reasonable in, in your view? Um, Maybe Saul. Yeah, I'll answer this one. Um, so with the loan credit facility, um, obviously that was raised in the judgment as well. Um, again, it, it will depend on the facts of the case. I think um, I was discussing with Alistair before that there's going to be a difference between those people who, like in this case, um, didn't have status, have never had status, and therefore have never been entitled to work. Um, and it was expressly said that in this case, um, they wouldn't be able to get a loan. And that was accepted by the judge. So that wasn't a requirement for them. Um, obviously, if you're on the 10 year route and you are maybe working or in a low income, and then you come to renew that leave and apply for a fee waiver, um, on the issues of, of loans uh, specifically, um, I don't know um, what level of evidence would need to be required. Um, I would imagine that if you did go to the bank and have it, you know, you made those inquiries and they refused to um, issue the loan, that could obviously go in as evidence in terms of your ability to raise the funds to pay the fee. Um, as to whether you'd be expected to go to every single bank um, or every single uh, person would just be a question of reasonableness in the, in the individual case, really. Um, and um, just uh, coming up to the end, perhaps end with a final question that came through um, before the seminar. Um, should we be making more fee waivers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the assuming the judgment stands, but even I mean, in some ways, even if even if it doesn't, given that the Home Office did concede that 
affordability as the correct test. Um, you know, the, the, the number of people eligible for fee waivers is clearly much larger than was thought. So absolutely, people who, uh, you know, don't appear to qualify under the policy as worded, you know, w w would appear to be uh, would appear to be eligible uh, on the basis of the points that the Secretary of State accepted during the course of the uh, the litigation. So, yeah, absolutely, they should. And I mean, just to pick up on a few uh, sort of themes that are going around. I mean, the the requirement to show to demonstrate your income and expenditure and the extent to which you can, in fact, afford the fee hasn't gone away. You know, unless you go down the path of saying, well, I'm not paying a fee at all, which, as I said, is risky in some ways or maybe risky for some people. Uh, if you are going for a fee waiver, you know, you've still got to show what your income is, what your outgoings are. You probably have to show that you aren't, uh, you know, squandering money on, you know, drugs and Ferraris and so on. And you have to, uh, you have to show that you, you can't, in fact, afford the fee. So although the test is, is a different one, there is still a test, there is still a threshold to be surmounted. So there still needs to be evidence of your income and outgoings and, you know, to some extent what's said in the existing policy about how you might prove that isn't completely you know, it's not completely unreasonable. Some of it is all the borrowing stuff, as sort of said, is uh, a bit out there. But, um, you know, some of the guidance as to how you might prove your income and uh, expenditure isn't all that unreasonable. Good. So your thoughts on fee waivers, or any, if we should be making more fee waivers, and any other final um, thoughts um, based on the discussion? Uh, yeah, there was just one thing. Um, I think someone asked as well about another practicality with the bank in terms of... Um, bank statements. Um, this is something I've come across in a couple of referrals recently because on the online form um, you submit the form and I think you have 10 days to submit the evidence um, and the question was about for some clients they're unable to get bank statements for 14 days um, and I've had a few ever refused because of this. Um, again this case wasn't about that specific point um, but I would say that in those cases, um, I think there is a facility to contact the Home Office, as in there's, a, there's an email address where you can email the destitution team. You can explain in advance of the 10 days expiring that you can't get the statements on these dates. That's what my client did. They still refused it anyway for failure to provide evidence. And then obviously, um, if that was me, I would send a pre-action letter because that's obviously unreasonable. Um, and in terms of whether we should be making more fee waivers, um, yes, um, same as what Alice has said, really. I mean, the, the numbers of refusals, I don't know the ones for this year, but um, I think last year, you know, they were, they were really, really high. Um, I think a lot of people, um, not many people would be in a position to actually pay for immigration applications, um, especially if it's a, if it's a family, um, like in this case. Um, so I definitely encourage people to, to make more applications and, and challenge it when, uh, when it's refused or if it's refused. Um, thank you very much. Um, we've come to the end of our time. It's now four o'clock. Um, so it just remains for me to thank very much um, speakers, Alistair McKenzie and Saul Stone, um, for what's been a really helpful presentation and for their insights. And to thank um, everyone um, online um, for your participation. Thank you very much. And I'll just finish by reminding everyone that the webinar and the slides uh, will be available on the Doughty Street Chambers website soon afterwards. So thank you very much.